Hello, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about zero-cost abstractions, as well as discussing how we go about uh, putting type constraints on generic types in C++, Rust, and Zig. Anyway, zero-cost abstractions. The idea is that if you can write your code such that it applies generally, but whenever you have a specific case, you also get optimized, uh, high-performance code, that's a good thing. We see from Bjarne Strohstrup, uh, that he likes to say that zero cost abstraction is what you don't use, you don't pay for. And further, what you do use, you couldn't hand code any better. Uh, for my example, I'm going to use the same thing as I had last week, which is the length of a vector in arbitrary dimensions and or two dimensions. Um, anyway, the common case, we know the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, or we say x squared plus y squared. Uh, the idea is how long is the diagonal or the length of your vector or line segment. It also applies in three dimensions or arbitrary dimensions. Anyway, so this example I'm going to use, I'm going to start out in C++. This is my uh, example from my last video. The idea here is that as long as I have any vector such that it contains floating point values and has an integral size, then I should be able to calculate the norm or the length of the vector. So for example here, here's my function norm and I loop across all the elements to take a squared plus b squared or x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus whatever, however many dimensions I want in my loop, and I return the square root of that sum. Now, I could use this to calculate the norm of a standard vector of doubles of arbitrary length. That means arbitrary dimensionality, really. Uh, alternatively, I could also focus on some customized type. For example, we know like, for example, in games or computer graphics, we don't want to represent all our points as standard vectors. Uh, that would be very inefficient. Uh, however, we might want to have a custom struct uh, that's designed specifically to do, say, 32-bit floating point, uh, just x and y values. This could be very efficient to have large numbers of or do operations on. But we can also abstract and say the size of this point is 2, or we can access an indexing operation where we can say if we access index 0, we get x, or index 1, we get y. Uh, the idea being that now our indexing operations here work on our point 2, and we have a size which is always going to be length 2, which means that ideally this works the same in both cases. So for example here, if I run this program, I get my length of my arbitrary vector here, or I get my length of my 3, 4, 5 triangle. I can make this whatever size I want to. I can make a 3, 5, however that ends up turning out. In any case, so just to prove the point that it works on standard vector of double or it works on my point two, which is going to again be a more efficient type. Thing is, ideally, uh, when we're doing the norm of point two, so I have this function here, norm, uh, which is designed to work abstractly for like, you know, say, general purpose linear algebra library. I could perhaps do a lot of more very fancy algorithms that I need for different use cases. And I can write them in a generic fashion. Then ideally, if I call it on a simple point like this, it is the same thing as if I just said square root of x squared plus y squared. That's what we want to see happen. In any case, though, let's, before we get into that and look at what the assembly code generated is, let's go ahead and look at Rust and Zig and see how we might do the same thing there. So here we are in Rust. Uh, one thing that's interesting to note is that Rust does not include numeric type traits built into the standard library. It does have traits built in that describe a lot of numerical operations such as add and multiply, but numeric ty type traits themselves are not included. There is a third party, uh, very well known crate called num that uh, allows and gives a lot of these numeric type traits to you. But in order to be self-contained, I'm not going to use that crate today. So I do have this trait called float here, which means it's uh, copyable and compile time sized, fixed sized. I also have add multiply operations. I also have a square root that I'm going to uh, say is required and a zero operation that's required. And I can implement this trait for arbitrary previously defined types, such as the built-in F32 primitive. So the square root for an F32 is just a square root, and the zero is the zero of type F32. And so we can move on, and now we can talk about a float vec, sort of like we had our float vec here in C++, or a float vec here in Rust, defined as a trait again. This is how you define uh, abstract types and their constraints in Rust. So the uh, float vec has to be of some kind of scalar, which is uh, going to conform to the float trait. And I also have a built-in trait called index in Rust, uh, which I'm going to say I'm going to index on u size uh, indexes, indices, and the output is going to be of type scalar. 
and I need to have a defined length also for my vectors if I'm going to treat them and know their dimensionality in advance. And this is how I've chosen to implement my norm function in each case here. Uh, although uh, it's possible, of course, that I could have implemented it just iterating through instead of requiring indexing and length operations. It's just this is a way to show that zero cost abstractions as well as being a little bit simpler to implement in some cases. Furthermore, a linear algebra library is likely to uh, want to have these kinds of operations available. Anyway, so here's my point two type, which in uh, Rust, your structs are always just structs. Anything you add to them is added through traits. So for example, I can say I implement the index trait for point two. The output type is going to be type F32. And I can index it. If I get index zero, I'll return X. And if I get index one, I'll return Y. I can also implement now float vec for point two. Now that point two conforms to the index uh, trait. Anyway, so now float vec f32, the length is going to always be length 2, sort of like we saw in C++. And then down here, here's my norm operation, uh, wherein I can say uh, I'm going to loop through the indices of my vector from 0 to length of the vector. I'm going to start with 0. I'm going to add up uh, x squared and y squared and z squared and so on. And then I'm going to uh, return the square root of that result. And then... Uh, Finally, I can also make a norm2 function that's focused specifically on point twos. I can also implement float vec for the standard vector type in Rust as well, just sort of like I did for the standard vector in C++. And I can do arbitrary computations down here again. I can do norm for any kind of uh, vector now because I've implemented this trait. Or I can do norm2, which uses point two. And if I come over here and I run it in Rust, I get the kind of results I expect to see. Now going on to Zig, Zig is a little bit interesting because it uh, does not have the same kind of parameterized types that you see in C++ or Rust. Instead, they focus on compile time operations. So for example, here my point two type is going to be a structure and I define some child ty some types internally. This is what my elements look like. This is my scalar in the other cases. I also define a size type, whatever I want it to be. I have an X and a Y. I'm just going to default them to zero because that's convenient. And, and I'm defining an at operation here. Now there's no operator overloading uh, in zig, so I have to define named functions inside of my struct. Uh, furthermore, there's no overloading of function generally except as members of structs. So that's why I've made sure to implement at and length internally here to point two. Um, now also in terms of uh, a generic function here, so here I have my generic function norm. Uh, which is decide, I've just said, you take whatever type you want, and then Zig knows to generate different versions of this function depending on the type I give it. I'm going to return the child type of my vector, and internally here I can define new types. And the one thing here I can do is there's no way to say at this level here uh, in Zig that I want to have it conform to particular uh, um, constraints, but I can run compile time assertions about my types. And so for example here, I've defined this function is float vec that says, is it a container? Like, you know, a struct, for example, does it have functions at and lan? Uh, does it have child uh, and size as uh, members inside of it? Is the child of type float, which could be an F32 or F64? Does the return type of the len function give me uh, is the same as the size? And I can make this more elaborate, as you imagine, if I want to. And then I can assert this, and this assertion will apply at compile time. Uh, such that uh, if the type doesn't conform, then this won't compile. And then meanwhile, my implementation here is just like we saw previously. I'm going to start at zero. I'm going to uh, loop across uh, each of my indices. I'm going to add up the squares, x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus whatever, and then I'm going to return the square root of that. I also have a specific norm2 function defined again that operates specifically on point twos. I did not uh, implement this for uh, built-in types in Zig in this particular example. I just focused on uh, my point two type, but I wrote it as if it were likely to be able to apply to other types of arbitrary length collections. And just to point out here, and I run this in Zig, I can actually run these compile time checks here. This will pre-calculate at compile time, whether point two conforms to float vec or whether i32, an integer, conforms to float vec. We can also see the result of our norm2 function calls. So if I say zig run here, 
I see that 0.2 is a float vec and I32 is not a float vec. Again, these values are uh, determined at compile time, not at runtime. And we can see our result of the length of our vector 3, 4, which is going to be a diagonal of 5. So now that we've seen how C++, Rust, and Zig can do these types of abstractions, let's go see what the generated x86-64 machine code looks like. Well, at least we're going to look at it in its assembly form. So to do this, we're going to go to this great and fantastic website called godbolt.org. This is from Matt Godbolt. This is the compiler explorer. Uh, and we can go on ahead and put in the code that we just ran. That's what I did a second ago. So right here I have my norm2 function, which calls my norm function, which is uh, generic uh, in terms of the kinds of vectors it can receive. But we're going to focus specifically on the point to implementation of it. And we see that we get incurred operations happening. We see have loops happening. We see we're having calls to the operators and so on and so forth. And this is what we don't want to have happen. This would be a very high cost abstraction. It should have been as simple as square root of x squared plus y squared. Uh, so the thing is, what happens if we up the optimization level? Let's go to dash o three for g plus plus. All of a sudden, we see a very different result here. Our norm two function now just has, uh, it's receiving its uh, values to registers XMM0 and XMM1. And we see that XMM0 is squared and XMM1 is squared. We're going to end up adding them together into XMM0. And then assuming that the sum of our squares is greater than 0, now interestingly here it gets 0 by XORing of uh, the register XMM2 with itself. I guess that's a fast way to get a 0. Anyway, if we have a value that's greater than zero, something that's greater than zero, we just return the, the CPU intrinsic uh, square root operation. And otherwise, we do something a little bit uh, fancier, I guess, to meet whatever kinds of constraints are required for the semantics of square root in C++. Anyway, so what we see here is not perhaps a fully optimized set of code, but it's not too far off from what happens if we use square root of x squared plus y squared. And let's actually look a little bit closer at that. Here's a different version where I replaced my call to my generic norm function with square root of x squared plus y squared. And here's the diff of the machine code generated. For we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight operations before the return. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven operations before the return. So it looks like that it's not quite as efficient as if I just written square root of x squared plus y squared by hand, but it's close. Meanwhile, let's go see the same kind of diff happening inside of Rust and Zig. So for Rust here, we see our abstract function being called. And in version 2, we're going to call square root of x squared plus y squared. And here's the diff of the operations. Notice there's a little bit of extra stuff sitting around here for these various other operations that we're not necessarily using, but it ended up in the output uh, machine code anyway. And uh, But we see also here that it wasn't quite as efficient. This one right here is uh, the version that's just square root of x squared plus y squared. And this is the version that goes through the abstraction. And we see there's a couple extra operations required here, but it's still very close and very efficient to what we would have written had we done the manual x squared plus y squared. Zig will see a very similar effect also. Here's the version that calls our abstract norm function. And here's the version that calls the square root of x squared plus y squared. And you notice, by the way, uh, I'm not sure exactly what Zig's doing with its LLVM configuration, but when I've exported norm2, that's all that's getting exported. And notice how very small the code is here, for good or ill, but in terms of the moment, I enjoy the fact that it's made it so small. Anyway, so here's the abstract form. It again has a couple of extra operations that aren't in the uh, non-abstract form, which is just the square root of x squared plus y squared. But again, it's very efficient. So instead of one, two, three, four, five, six operations, we only have four operations before we get to that return. Meanwhile, uh, I think this is pretty interesting, and I'm glad that my conjecture that these abstractions work out to being efficient machine code actually turned out to be real, because that way I can write again some kind of abstract linear algebra library and still have it apply to very specific types and be almost efficient as if I had written those specifically for those types. Anyway, maybe we'll have a chance to talk more about compiler optimizations and abstractions in the future. Bye, y'all.